locked in. Look at what we have here, folks. To the only show that matters. The cream of the crop. Duke loves wrestling. And there is no one that does it better than your host. I have come here to chew bubblegum and kick ass. The Duke. And I'm all out of bubblegum. Easy like Sunday morning, even though it's Thursday evening, but that's a whole nother story. Welcome back to Duke Loves Wrestling, the show about pro wrestling and everything else. I am the man of the hour, the man with the power, too sweet to be sour, the Duke. How are you? Shout out to Lionel Richie, by the way. You know, Lionel Richie, I got to say something. First of all, he's in the Songwriters Hall of Fame. He legitimately is one of the greatest singer-songwriters of all time. He's tearing it up on American Idol. Can you believe that that young whippersnapper, even though she's she's pretty close to my age, but that young whippersnapper, Katy Perry, she didn't know that Lionel Richie wrote Lady, the song that Kenny Rogers uh, had a massive hit with. You know, Lionel was talking about the fact that Kenny Rogers is responsible for Lionel's uh, career as a as a single artist you know not part of the group the commodores but as a as a solo artist and and songwriter lady was the song that really skyrocketed lionel richie and that was back in the late 70s there Katy perry had no clue how the hell do you work with somebody for two years a legend like lionel richie and you don't even google the guy i mean ugh, just distasteful so Katy perry I, I like you i like your music but it, you really you let me down and 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 the the other guy out there, what is it, Luke Bryant? If you don't know that Lionel Richie has country music hits, if you don't know that, Ceylon and and you know what what's the other one that he had that was really uh, an amazing one? What was that? Stuck on you. If you don't know that that Lionel Richie has those two massive country hits, then you better do your your Google language, uh, Google research, and all that good stuff too. Because I'm telling you right now, I can't stand these young whippersnappers that don't know their history. It's like these young pro wrestlers who keep saying something ridiculous, like uh, Shawn Michaels is the greatest wrestler of all time. Hey, Ric Flair, <laughs> hello. You have you have YouTube. The WWE Network is only $9.99 a month. You can find out who the greatest wrestler of all time. Just type in Ric Flair. Give me a break. That's right. Listen, folks, we're, we're on the road to WrestleMania. Uh, it's less than two weeks away, and I can't wait to really dig into some of the things happening. Uh, we're going to be touching upon that stuff this week. I also have a very special guest from River Horse Photography. We're talking about Alan Roulette. This guy legitimately is my favorite photographer on the planet. I'm telling you right now, he's even better than I am. And I, that takes a lot. You know, I'm the Duke. It takes a lot for me to say that somebody is better at something than I am, even though I'm a horrible photographer, but that's not the point. But we're going to talk to Alan about uh, some of the wrestlers he's taken pictures of, his process, you know, the whole nine yards there. We'll also cover the top stories in the world of professional wrestling, a.k.a. run the ropes. But before I get to any of that, I got to give a shout out. I got to give a shout out to a young lady who legitimately is not only an inspiration, but she's just a warrior. And I'm talking about indie wrestler Riley Shepard. If you head over to her website, RileyShepard.com, she has a blog up. Uh, she posted, posted it on March 25th, so just a couple days ago. And it's entitled Injuries and Defiance. Boy, I challenge anybody to read this thing and walk away without some some tears in their eyes. I mean, it just it's a hell of a read. She talks about the fact that some nagging injuries have have caught up with her, you know, ACL, MCL, some really bad stuff with her knee. And she's going to be taking some time off. In fact, I believe she just had surgery yesterday. So, you know, shout out to Riley Shepard pulling for you. Wish the best for you. I mean, she's wrestled in, in Ring of Honor and Shine and all over these places. And she has a very good reputation. She's won some championships. Just really a great person. I, I've actually uh, spent some time talking to her a little bit. And we'll have her on the show sometime soon as well. But, you know, shout out to Riley Shepard. She's awesome. And, and I really want you folks to to read 
her uh, blog because it talks about something that we don't hear enough about, which is what happens? What happens when these wrestlers have to take extended periods of time off? And from a psychological standpoint, what does that feel like? Of course, the physical toll can be tough, but psychologically, what's going on? You know, you're wondering, am I ever going to make it back in the ring? Will I ever be the same? If I don't stop right now, am I going to injure not only myself, but the other people in the ring who who are trusting me with their bodies? I mean, just really powerful, powerful stuff that she goes over there. So again, RileyShepard.com, that's R-I-L-E-Y-S-H-E-P-A-R-D.com. Go to her blog section and, and it's entitled Injuries and Defiance. I mean, just really, really good stuff. So shout out to Riley. Also, another shout out. Hey, my man, Roy Lusher, he just got announced uh, as being the social media manager for the Cauliflower Alley Club. So congratulations to Roy Lusher, you know, the super fan. He's my brother right there. He's been on the show a bunch of times. Uh, The Cauliflower Alley Club, they're the nonprofit organization that collects money in order to help wrestlers who are down on their luck. Maybe they have a major surgery or some other issues going on and they could use a few extra bucks to help out with paying for that stuff. So the Cauliflower Alley Club, I mean, they're really doing a great job. Shout out to B. Brian Blair and everybody else involved. And congratulations to Roy, the new social media manager. So definitely check them out on all the social medias, Instagram, YouTube, uh, Twitter, Facebook, you name it. You'll see some of Roy's work. But more importantly, you'll see some of the great stuff going on with the Cauliflower Alley Club. Just great folks there. So that does it for my shout outs. And let's just jump right into it, folks. Let's run the ropes. It's time to run the ropes. It's when I cover the top stories in the world of professional wrestling. Let's go. Hot stuff coming up. WWE star expecting a new child. That's right, folks. Uh, WWE star JoJo. So, you know, she tried out becoming a wrestler. Actually, she actually did wrestle a little bit in NXT, but she ended up uh, being a fantastic ring announcer. So that's where she's been primarily used the past four or five years. Well, she just announced on her Instagram that we, we are pregnant. And listen. Don't get any funny ideas here. As, as wonderful as JoJo is, uh, the goddamn girl ain't mine. You know, as, as uh, Michael Jackson would say, uh, Bray Wyatt is the alleged father of the child, which I say alleged because he hasn't personally come out and said, yes, that's my baby. But, you know, put two and two together, folks. Of course, these folks, they're in a relationship right now. They're expecting a bundle of joy. Uh, JoJo, as always, she looks fantastic. That belly is really big. You know, as, as, as Dusty Rose would say, my belly's big, my hiney's big, but I'm bad, brother, and they know I'm bad. Well, that's JoJo right now. You know, she just, she just looks great. And she's, she has that, that motherly glow going on as she's waiting for this uh, bundle of joy to pop out. So congratulations, JoJo. Congratulations, Bray. WWE.com even did a little uh, blurb about it, which is pretty cool. So always nice to see, you know, folks are happy starting new chapters in their lives and uh hey you know all we can do as fans is continue to wish them well so congrats espn disrespect charlotte flair no that's not gonna do it yeah i I don't know what the hell is going on here but uh this past monday charlotte flair becky lynch and ronda rousey they appeared on ESPN, and, and first and foremost, congratulations to these three ladies. It was officially announced that they will be the main event at WrestleMania, which is just tremendous. It's something that we've all been pulling for, especially me. I want to see the women in the main event. They've been carrying the ball. They've been doing a great job. Show me the women in the main event. So it's been announced they're going to be it. Well, there were little blurbs. The little blurbs when the ladies were being interviewed, uh, you know, there was a blur about Ronda being the UFC Hall of Famer and all this good stuff. There was a blurb about 
Becky winning uh, the Royal Rumble and all this good stuff. And then we get to Charlotte. And what did they say about Charlotte? Daughter of Ric Flair. Now, listen, I understand that Ric Flair is the greatest wrestler of all time. And it is notable that his daughter is a WWE superstar. Sure, sure. But it's Charlotte freaking Flair. I mean, you know, as of this recording, she's an eight-time women's champion. She was an NXT champion. I mean, we can go on and on and on and on. I believe she was the last Divas champion and the first WWE women's champion. What the hell is going on here? How, how can you disrespect literally a living legend right now? And I say living legend for this reason. If Charlotte Flair stops wrestling today, she will go down in history as one of the greatest women's wrestlers of all time. She will go down in history as a trailblazer, as somebody who legitimately broke the glass ceiling and never looked back. Okay? She's headlined pay-per-views already and the first to do it. In fact, I think she's the first to headline not only an NXT pay-per-view, but she's the first to headline um, a any WWE main card pay-per-view for as a woman. You know, she did it with Sasha Banks. So come on, what, what, what are we doing here? What are we doing? It just, it really uh, is embarrassing. It's disappointing. And it's poor form by ESPN, a company that put Charlotte Flair in, in their body issue, which they had all of her accolades in that thing. A company that has interviewed Charlotte Flair a million times. They, they, they know who Charlotte Flair is. What, what is going on? And she's a lot more than just the daughter of Ric Flair. So, you know, that that's just sexist and ridiculous by ESPN. Get your act together. Wh- whoever's in charge of that, you just drop the ball. Disappointed in that. But um, shout out to Charlotte. You know, I, I we give her a hard time, and I think sometimes we take her for granted. But I don't think there is anyone else on the roster, male or female, who has churned out more quality matches in their career than Charlotte Flair. If you take a look at Charlotte Flair's body of work for the amount of time she's been in the business, show me anyone else. AJ Styles would probably be the closest person you can get to at this point. But show me anybody else who puts on matches that are as quality as Charlotte Flair. Good luck. Good luck. She's that damn good. She's that damn great. So we need to respect her and ESPN, get your get your act together. Seriously. I don't think you'd be calling Randy Orton the son of Cowboy Bob Orton. So don't do that to, to Charlotte Flair and just leave it at that. Okay? She's accomplished. Respect her. Kofi Kingston going to WrestleMania. Yes, please. That's right, folks. Uh, we saw it this past week on SmackDown Live. New Day won a gauntlet series where they had to take on multiple tag teams, but they managed to win it. And what was up for grabs? Kofi Kingston going to WrestleMania. How awesome is that? Seriously, how awesome is that? I mean, here's a guy who, you know, he's been in the business over 11 years and he's paid his dues. And finally, he's going to get a chance to perform on the largest stage of them all and a co-main event. So it's not going to be the last match like the women's match, but you know, it's going to be another featured match against Daniel Bryan, one of the greatest of all time, and those guys are going to tear the house down. And if by chance Kofi Kingston wins that championship, that will be historic. So, you know, all of Massachusetts and, and all over the world, everybody's rooting for Kofi Kingston because this guy is just awesome. His story is great. I love what's going on with this with this storyline overall. The arcs, the highs, the lows. Some of it's been a little hokey. Some of it's been a little disrespectful. Overall, though, it'll be a feel-good moment, especially when Kofi walks out on that WrestleMania stage. And if he walks out of that ring with that championship, the, the, the place will just go bananas. So congratulations, Kofi Kingston. Go out there and kill it, brother. Retirements in two different sports. Let me out of here! That's right. Uh, we had two retirements over the past week. We had uh, Conor McGregor, 
retired officially from UFC, and Rob Gronkowski retired from the NFL. Now, what does that matter? Well, there's speculation that both stars may be getting involved in the pro wrestling game sooner rather than later. In the case of Conor McGregor, everyone is is assuming that he'll at least appear in the WWE at least once because he, he's made for pro wrestling. The trash talking, the swagger, the fact that he walks around like he's Vince McMahon, it would be interesting to see Conor McGregor in a WWE ring. But, and this is my opinion, I think the WWE will pass on McGregor and AEW end up landing him instead, and he'll come out and do like a one or two shot deal with them, a la Mike Tyson did with the WWF years ago. You can quote me on that, so when it happens, I want full credit. I want full credit, damn it. That's right. Uh, But Rob Gronkowski, on the other hand, and, and this is a guy who is good friends with Mojo Rawley, Rob Gronkowski, who just retired from the Patriots, hmm, Are we going to see him at WrestleMania? Hmm. Will we see Rob Gronkowski in matches? Hmm. I think so. I think it's just a matter of time, but I I think, of course, it's going to happen. And we've seen Gronk at at WrestleMania before, so now he'll have more time and opportunity to really have a match. That would be interesting. Does this mean that that Gronkowski is going to turn into a a full-time wrestler? Probably not. But, you know, a couple of special events, a couple of shots here or there. Hey, why not? We're getting to a point where you can have it all on the same wrestling card. You can have the best wrestling in the world where you have women like Charlotte Flair and Sasha Banks kicking butt. And you can have featured attractions like a Rob Gronkowski and it will be okay. So we'll have to wait and see how that that shakes out. But this will be interesting. And the number one story in the world professional wrestling is Vincent Kennedy McMahon sells a bunch of stock. That's right, folks. Uh, This is interesting. I mean, some of you out there may be like, what? How is this the top story? Well, (laughs) when Vince McMahon, who's the majority owner of the WWE, when he sells off over $200 million worth of stock, and then he takes that money and he's, he's going to pad his Alpha Entertainment Company, the, the umbrella company for the XFL. Hey, that's a big deal. And keep in mind, you know, they're expecting XFL to launch next year. Uh, I believe that's, you know, 2021. They expect something, excuse me, 2020. They expect that to launch. Yeah, that's a big deal, man. That's a big deal. He's doing everything in his power to make sure the XFL is financially sound, that they have a good foundation from a financial standpoint so they can at least survive the year, something that some of these arena football leagues really haven't been able to do. You know, they're constantly having to go back and borrow money. They're in trouble. I think, what is that league? The AAF? I don't think they're going to be around for another year, even though they were they aired on the NFL Network, which is kind of crazy. So it'll be interesting to see uh, how the XFL shakes out. But the fact that Vince has sold so much of his WWE stock, and he, of course he has plenty more, but he sold enough in order to finance this project. That's That's a big deal. That's a big deal. And it goes back to the next question. How involved will Vince McMahon be in the WWE in the next year? Will he truly step away? And Vince Kennedy McMahon is a good friend of mine. We all know that. So I, I can tell you my opinion. And this is an inside scoop. So, so I don't want to read this in any of the dirt sheets or anything like that. But my opinion, of course, Vince is going to step away. He's going to focus on this football venture because that's that's a challenge for him. That's what he wants to do. The WWE is making money hand over fist. They're in a position where they're signing literally the greatest, biggest name athletes. They're trying to get Serena Williams for for goodness sake. Can you believe that? They're trying to sign Serena Williams to have some kind of involvement in world wrestling entertainment. That's all you need to know about where the WWE is right now. So for Vince to take on this XFL challenge and try to do something with it of substance. Hey, I'm all for it, man. Do it. Make it work. But more importantly, how will this affect 
WWE as a brand, and especially the wrestling shows, Raw and SmackDown, how is that going to affect them? Less events. Will this be positive or negative? You tell me. Let me know what you think. Me personally, I don't know. I don't know. Some say that Vince is out of touch. I don't know. Guess we're going to have to wait and find out. No, dear, that's wrong. You've heard what I think. Now, what do you think? Do you agree with me? Do you think I'm a jerk? Maybe something in between? Head over to Facebook. Head over to Twitter. Type in Duke Loves Wrestling and let me know. Up next, my man from River Horse Photography, we're talking about the one Alan Roulette. This is former WWE superstar Al Snow, and I have created the wrestling brand, collar and elbow brand. It's wrestling apparel made by a wrestler for the wrestling fan in all of us. The love, the passion you have for wrestling is in this apparel. Collarandelbowbrand.com. Buy it today and also round up your purchase and help support the former wrestlers who made it possible for you to love wrestling today. Go to CollarAndElbowBrand.com and help support Cauliflower Alley Club and their charitable effort. You know, folks, it's, it's interesting when we think about what's going on today. Probably never in history have folks been so, so engrossed with photography. You know, we want to take pictures of our food. We want to take pictures of our, our pets. We want to take pictures of ourselves staring in the bathroom mirror. You know, it's pretty cool. And the idea is what we want to do is capture moments that help tell a story about our lives. Everybody has a cell phone or a, a tablet or even a computer that takes photos. Nonetheless, as we know, there are some folks who are professionals who are really doing it and doing it on a big level there. And there's one person in particular who I have just been an avid fan of their work especially some of the, the stuff that they've done with some of our favorite pro wrestlers out there. And I just, I couldn't help myself. I had to get this guy on the show because I wanted to talk about what he's doing, how he's doing it, and hopefully get some tips on how to become a better photographer my own self. So without further ado, from River Horse Photography, we're talking about the one, the only, Alan Roulette. Just like the roulette uh, wheel, right, Alan? Absolutely. <laughs> That's <laughs> trying to make a little money. <laughs> exactly. Now, listen, do do people mess up your name? Because it's not spelled like the like the game. Uh, right. You, know, you spell a little differently. But do people mess up your name generally? Yeah, but it's it's kind of my family's fault. Uh, when they came here, they're French Canadian, and when they got here, they came through Louisiana, and they were illiterate. They couldn't they just couldn't spell. <laughs> so when they got there, they'd ask them, well, "What's your name?" It's like, "Well, that." And they're like, well, how do you spell that? And they're, I don't know. And kind of they winged it. And, and they, you know, four generations later, we're <laughs> everybody's still wow. the name wrong. So, so I get roulette and roulette and roulette and roulette and you know, just all kinds of stuff. And most people just call me yeah. River Horse. So <laughs> that's right. That's right, River Horse. And, and you know, it's funny because that's a that's a very catchy name. That's a, that's a great name for your company to explain to our listeners what River Horse Photography is. And generally speaking, why it should matter to them? Well, the the name is uh, it's weird. I, I, when I was a kid, I was obsessed with hippopotamuses. I love them, and uh, the fact that they sweat red stuff, and the fact that they, you know, they can, their jaws can snap, you know, steel and all this stuff. I mean, it was like the superhero of animals. You know, they run forty five miles an hour and that kind of thing. So I've always been obsessed with hippos. And um, when you get older, I mean, I'm an older guy now and you get a family, and you get people who care about you, uh, everybody buys you that one thing you like. No one gets you, <laughs> like, no one takes any consideration into what you really want. They go, well, you like hippos, just get a hippo. And so my house is just filled with them. I mean, ceramic hippos and pictures of hippos and just, I mean, everything. So uh, river horse, uh, um, hippopotamus is actually Greek, for, and it means river horse. So... Uh, I, when I started my company, like this incarnation of my company where it's just me and no one else, uh, I wanted to, in, you know, incorporate hippos into it because, you know, I'm crazy. And, uh, so I was like, well, you know, I can make a, uh, hippo photography and I'm like, ah, that doesn't roll. And I'm like, well, maybe hippotography. And I asked my wife and she's like, wow, that's, that's really stupid. 
<laughs> and I'm like, okay, um, <laughs> all right. So she goes, yeah, you really need to leave the hippos out of it. And we've been married, I don't know, 20 some odd years at that point, almost 20 years or whatever it was. So at that point, you know, it was a, now it's a challenge. How can I do it so that she didn't call it stupid instead of just bailing on it? So, um, so then I was like, you know, river horse photography. So I looked it up and checked out names and checked out everything and it was completely safe. Uh, wasn't using somebody else's company. And, uh, so I, I told her, I'm like, river horse photography. And she's like, wow, that sounds really exotic and great and everything. I'm like, yeah, it's hippos, you know, so it's not so stupid. That, you know, it's kind of like, so, um, the, the, the whole idea getting into photography was the idea. I just kind of wanted people to see things how I do. Um, yeah, I mean, everybody just kind of wants to be understood. And, uh, you, uh, you look at, you, you, you want people to look at life the way you look at it. So, when I was a kid, I did photography and would show people pictures and they'd go, that's so weird and that's so this and that's so that. And I would tell them, that's how I saw it, you know. So um, as I got older, I was like, I want people to see my perspective of how I see them or how I see their product or how I see their home when I do real estate photography. And then in wrestling, it was, I want people to see how I see people in wrestling, you know. So um, I think. I have kind of a unique take on things, and uh, even when it's not wholly unique, it, it has it has my spin on it. And um, you know, that's I think people should take that away when they hire me. You're going to get something that's unique. You're going to get something I really really care about, and uh, you're going to get something that that will be meaningful to you and and is meaningful to me. I mean, I don't know everyone's life story that I shoot, but the pictures that I do of them are meaningful. You stare in their eyes for hours when you're processing it, and you really feel like you get to know the people that you're <laughs> – you look into somebody's eyes for, like, six hours, picture after picture after picture. You really kind of feel like you get to know them, and you start to fill in the blanks on their story in your head, and you go, they must be a really good whatever. And they seem really – and none of it's true. It's just what you fill in. <laughs> of but course, of course. To, so you process based off of that story, so. Well, you know, you're an interesting guy, and, and – what I like about your work is that there's definitely a theme there, whether you're looking at, you know, your website there, uh, riverhorsephotography.com. You also have Riverhorse Wrestling Photography. So you have a separate division within your brand that really is, is geared towards <laughs> and you're trying to uh, attract the pro wrestlers. But there's there's definitely a, a theme. There's a, there's a theme there. What is that? Like, what? How did you come up with this concept? Because a lot of your photos generally have this larger than life, um, beauty, uh, it, it jumps out. Like it, it's, it's, it's almost like it's right in front of you. You know what I mean? As far as the, the quality and the sharpness of it, what have you. Where does that Thank come you. from? Um, when you watch wrestling, that's what you want. You, you watch it because they're superheroes and they're doing things that you can't do in life and they're, you know, I can't yell up. I can't st stone cold stunner my boss, or you know, I can't. You know, I can't just yell all the time. What I listen, you know, I, just, I can't do all of that. And so you watch it because it's a release. And when you look at the photography, or at least from my perspective, photography should reflect that. You should look at it and get a story from one picture. And you write the story in your head. I mean, you may not necessarily know what the story is, but everybody's emotional and they're reaching and they're grabbing or they're pointing or they're whatever. And you start to fill in all of those gaps in your head. Um, the other thing I really like to do that a lot of people don't do is uh, I always try to make sure my subjects are looking at the camera, like right dead at the camera and making that eye to eye connection with whoever's looking at the picture. So they look at that picture, they look at that person, their body or their face or their costume or whatever's telling a story, the lighting's helping to tell the story, and then they're writing a story in their head based off of what they're seeing. And then they feel something. And that's the definition of art is doing something and making somebody feel something that they didn't feel before they looked at it. So that's kind of, kind of how I look at it. <laughs> it's a little Absolutely. weird, but, you know. Yeah. No, no, it, it it makes sense. And again, when you look at the photography, I didn't really realize that until now. You're absolutely right. Um, the overwhelming majority of those photos, the subject absolutely is looking right at uh, the right. camera, which means they're looking they're, right at 
the audience. Right. And if they're not looking at the camera, what they're doing is telling a story, you know, or Absolutely. their body is telling a story or the um, it's when I shot uh, one of the people you interviewed, Sophie Castillo, uh, that was one of the one shoot out of maybe 10 that I've done my whole life where we did so many pictures. She wasn't looking at the camera because I realized that those pictures didn't need that. You know, what she was, she's a dancer and she's expressive and what she was doing was telling the story and looking at me with the camera was distracting. But most of the time with promos or family portraits or couples portraits or something, I usually have somebody making a connection with the person who's looking at the picture. Well, what's interesting, and I'm glad that you brought uh, Sophie Castillo up, and, and shout out to Sophie. She's doing a great job on the independent wrestling scene. She was on the show a few shows back, folks. Sophie, whenever she gets coverage out there, and, and you know her interview on the Duke Loves Wrestling podcast got massive coverage on, on the various websites, the only photos that folks are using are your photos yeah. when, they're try when they're writing articles about the interview. That photo set, quite frankly, is, is one of the best photo sets I've ever seen of anybody. Like, legitimately, yeah. I don't care who we're talking about, the biggest movie star, the biggest uh, sports star, my friend down the street, that photo set and, and the layers and the different themes, you know, even the black and white where you're showing a little bit of this and, and you're hiding a little bit of that, it just, oh, my goodness, just really, really a, an amazing photo set. Yeah, and that's only about five pictures out of about 50 or 60. So there's that, that definitely is a story that's to be continued. So. <laughs> like, Absolutely. And, Absolutely. Yeah. So. Now, how did you get involved with uh, shooting pro wrestlers? Because listen, pro wrestling, it doesn't matter where you go on the planet. You can find somebody who calls themselves a pro wrestler. And, and you know, here right. in the United States, we have an embarrassment of riches. We have pro wrestling everywhere, There's a, which means that there is a, a, a very big um, competitive market as far as photographers are concerned because every wrestler wants promo shots and, and they want to have these shots yeah. that they can not only put on their social media but send out to the various wrestling companies they want to work at. How did you get your foot in the door? Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. How, how did you um, get your foot in the door then? So I, I've always been a really big wrestling fan. When I was a kid, I, you know, we lived in a neighborhood that I couldn't really go out much in because um, it was, you know, kind of dangerous. And um, so my dad kept me in a lot. So it was kind of a shut-in. And, uh, you know, my dad wasn't the most sensitive cat in the entire planet, so he's like, here, snap the TV on, watch this. And um, so I, I did a lot of channel flipping and, I'm really good at trivia. People like me on their trivia teams because I'm really good at like 70s and 80s like television because you know I was kind of raised by the TV. So, um, so I, I've always watched wrestling, and when wrestling got really super huge, like night the Monday Night Wars and and you know all of that, it was personally very exciting for me. Like I was just excited. I watched. Taped one, watched the other, couldn't figure out which one I wanted to tape so I can watch the other. Then EC, I mean, ECW premiered in Florida the night my son was born. So uh, I went home, left my son and wife alone in the hospital because we were just talking and talking and talking and no one was getting any sleep. So they suggested I go home for a little while and uh, walked in my door, sat down, put my keys down, and my VCR just clicked and stopped. And I was like, Oh, let me check this out. And it was the night Shane Douglas threw the belt down. It was the night my oh, before, you know, it's just it's yes. crazy. It's like <laughs> so um it was insane. So on the on the old Sunshine Network. So um it's always been very meaningful to me and always been a huge source of entertainment for me. But when I did photography it was never I never put two and two together before. You know, I'd always read the Pro Wrestling Illustrated magazine and all its sister magazines and the you know, it was before the Internet, so those were the only pictures you got to see. And I only knew a wrestler looked the way they did because of the picture that was in the magazine. And, you know, uh, Paul Heyman started off as a wrestling photographer, and that sticks in your head. And you're just like, still never put two and two together, ever. And one day I was, um, I used to take my kids to the indie matches. And uh, the uh, I was in Orlando, and I was watching, uh, I think it was an Evolve show. 
I think it was Evolve, or it might have been FIP, Florida uh, Full Impact Pro, but I think it was uh, an Evolve show. And Ringside was the modern myth of modern myth photography. And he's just unique to look at. Uh, he dresses very unique. His photography is very unique. And I just saw him there at Ringside, and I was just spellbound. I'm like, and I, I hate to admit it. Um, I, I started feeling very petty at that point. I'm like, what the heck is he doing down there? And I'm not there. You know, like, I should photograph. I'm a photographer, you know, and I want to be next to the ring and I want to be right. But God, it would be great. My seats suck. And I wish I was right there, you know, God, right there. And I could really, you know. So it just started feeling more and more petty and more and more petty and more and more petty. And, and at uh, that moment, that's when you picked up a chair and, and, and bashed him over the head and screamed, <laughs> ECW! Nah, he was, he is, he's a tough bird, man. There's no way I would take a shot at him, but <laughs> the, uh, I, I looked at it and I was just like, God, I, I want that so bad. And then it took a little while to figure out where to go from there. So I started bringing my camera equipment to shows and I would get expensive seats. I'd get the VIP or I'd get the, whatever the, you know, the expensive seat was. And then I would shoot from the audience and then I tagged everybody that I could see anyone I saw in the picture, anybody I could find out was associated with the company, you know, Trevin Adams and, you know, Sal, and Gabe Sapolsky. And you know, I was just tagging everybody under the sun, uh, all the wrestlers that were in the picture and blah, 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 blah. And uh, one day Trevin, you know, answered back, which is really weird because when you're talking into the abyss, it's easy. <laughs> you know, when you're, when you're sure. driven into a black hole, it's easy and you can just, you do more and more, and I, man, I post 63 pictures today, and nobody caught me back, you know. <laughs> blah, blah, blah. <laughs> and one day, I get this message back going, uh, hello, sir, this is the brand ambassador from WWN, and uh, I really like what you're doing. And I'm like, oh, crap, like now i now I got to put up or shut up. So uh, I continued to tag him and continue to have conversations with him, and he invited me out to shoot a uh, FIP show. and um, it was at uh, Gods and Monsters, which is a comic book store in Orlando. It's like, it was comic book heaven actually there. And so uh, they would set the ring up in the store, and it was it was incredible. It was an incredible venue. And I showed up, and I had my cameras, and I had no idea what I was doing, like none, because wrestling photography is very unique, and not everybody can do it. And you don't learn that until you start doing it. You know, you just think it's the same thing as shooting a football game or such and such. So. Um, I got there and I met with Trevin, shook his hand and all of that. And uh, he's like, hey, there's the ring and, you know, just have at it. And I'm like, do you need anything in particular? Do you have, I started asking him all the questions I asked my regular clients. Uh, what are you looking for from the shoot? Uh, what are you, he just looked at me and he's like, no, let's go to the ring and shoot some pictures. And I'm like, no, you know, uh, <laughs> but what, what's the mood that you're looking for? I mean, just all the normal. And I started to realize this is not the same thing that I do, you know. So I shut up before I sound like a complete idiot, and I walked down to the ring, and um, Sadiel Ruiz was there, Speedy, Speedy of Speedy uh, Photos, mm -hmm. Speedy Productions, and uh, he was there, and he was looking at his equipment and checking levels and doing all this stuff, and uh, I walked over and just kind of sidled next to him, and I'm like, uh, hey. He's like, yeah, hi, uh, yeah, and he goes back to working because he's working, and I'm like, uh this is my first time, which obviously it showed. I was like, you know, it, was, it wasn't, it was, it was abundantly obvious that it was my first time. And he's like, okay, good. And I'm like, you have any advice for, which is not what, if anybody did that to me now, I'd roll my eyes and probably do what he did. But, oh, you know, no. it's, you know, which, which was, he said, look, that's the hard camera. Don't stand in front of it. This is such and such. Don't stand here. Go over there. This is where I'm going to be. And, you know, let's try and stay out of each other's way and uh, have a good shoot. And I'm like, thanks, you know, <laughs> young and excited and whatever. And so I shot the show and it was crazy hard. And, you know, I didn't know what settings I wanted to use. And I played through it. And a lot of the stuff was blurry. And some of it, well, most of it wasn't, but there was a lot of mistakes in there. And uh, I, get, I sent the photos to Trevin. And he's like, this is fantastic. And I'm like, really? You know, so I was like, well, I guess I want to do this again because I wasn't sure. I was like, you know, I'd already told myself I was done. You know, like I sent the pictures. I'm like, this is it. I don't really want to do this anymore. I don't understand why I did this. And he's like, these are good. And I'm like, yeah, of course it is. Yeah, yeah. 
I do this again. So started coming out more and more often. And then about, you know, they started having some problems with uh, the regular photographer showing up. You know, they got, that person got really super busy and, you know, just couldn't do both, you know. And uh, they asked me, would you like to shoot promotional photos? And so I did, it, you know, an ACW show about two and a half years ago or something. And I uh, shot those promo pictures and they liked them. And next thing I know, I was shooting promo pictures every time I showed up and I would shoot ringside after that. And, you know, I started sales and started selling to fans and selling to wrestlers and eventually started being paid by promotions. And, you know, I mean, it's a long story to say the rest is history, but, you know, it's history. So That's, that's impressive. And, and it, it, it really is a lesson, especially uh, for folks out there listening. Sometimes you just got to take a chance. You know, yeah. and, and it's it's when I hear you talk about how you broke in, I think about how the show started. And literally, I was just messaging some of my favorite wrestlers uh, from yesterday, you know, guys right. who had already been retired, like Steve Dewitt, Tewitt Cox and the Black Nature Boy, Scoot Andrews, who's a Andrews, Florida yeah. guy, too. And uh, eventually they responded back and was like, yeah, we'll we'll give you a shot. Kid. We'll come on your show. And it kind of snowballed from there, which I'm guessing is what happened to you. I mean, once you got your foot in right. the door, word of mouth started to spread. Well, this guy's all right. You should check him out. Name right. some of the, the the wrestlers that you've done um, private shoots with, not not just stuff that in the ring, but legitimately, you know, they've come to you and you set up location. You've done some personal shoots for. Okay. Uh, most of the time, uh, I get promos at a show. Uh, it'll be before or during intermission. Sometimes afterwards, we'll hang around afterwards. Um, ones that have come to me, and we've shot at my home, which is where my studio is. Uh, I've, I shot Britt Baker there, uh, Rebel from TNA. Um, this Sunday coming up, I have Amber Nova coming. Um, you know, it's – but most of the time, it's – a lot of times it's sort of up-and-coming people. They don't want to go and – Wrestlers really aren't shy about getting their picture taken, uh, but new wrestlers can be. And so you do promos, and they wait till nobody's watching, and they kind of slide over to do promos with you. But most of the time, they're really more comfortable just doing them privately. They'd rather pay the money and do them privately. Um, and then they see what they did, and they see what they have, and then they go, oh, my God. And then they're fine shooting in public at that point. They're just like, I'll just do what I did last time. And, I put my arm up this way and I'm, you know, and it's, it works well, but the majority of, of the private shoots I do, while I have done big people, I've, you know, they're almost always somebody who's smaller and wants to work things out. And, uh, I just did a shoot a couple of weeks ago. Uh, there were, there were three people who just graduated wrestling school and they came to my home and we spent an hour and a half. And, um, the interesting thing about it though is it's not just, shooting photography it's almost working characters out for people at that level um you go i ask them yeah well who are you and what do you do well you know me i'm, I'm johnny i'm bobby i'm you know ricky i'm mike you know it's like, <laughs> <laughs> um, they go uh you know you know me and i'm like no who are you in the ring what do you do to pop the crowd why should people care about you and show me that are you a baby face or a heel i'm a heel well, just give me some nasty dirty heel stuff and they're like Ur. and i'm like no you're not scaring me. I'm like, scare me, mean mug me, scare me, you know? <laughs> and we work on that. And then lo and behold, you'll see them at a show a couple of months later and you'll see something you did with them that they're doing now. And it's a back and forth, you know, then they work out a bunch of stuff and then they come shoot with you again and they've got stuff that's worked out and you're in a weird way, kind of on some level, helping them develop their character or developing who they develop, who they are. And that's, that's the fun part of doing that. Bigger people that I've shot at shows, I, I did Brian Cage, I've shot Allison Kay, Santana Garrett, you know, I mean, anyone who shot, anyone who's, who's been with Shine, uh, I've shot most people who are with Evolve, uh, I did uh, Full Throttle Pro Wrestling, so Rob Terry, um, I shot Ron Simmons at one of those shows, you know, those are great, you get a private 5 or 10 minutes, 15 sometimes. Uh, if nobody's coming, you can get 20 or 20 minutes or 30 minutes and do some really fun stuff. But, and they're not working characters out. They're there because they want what you have to offer. You know, you're like, 
and like I spend all my time working on my body and you're going to make my body look good and you're going to make my character look good and we're going to do that. So there's sort of two ends to the spectrum. One of them is brainstorming and working and all of that, which is so much fun. And then the rest of it is capturing what's already out there. They're throwing it out there and it's my job like a center fielder to try and catch it as it's falling from the sky on, on camera, you know. So, um, Brock, Matt Riddle, uh, just a bunch of people. <laughs> like some of the pictures, <laughs> there's actually pictures that I've shot that nobody knows I've shot ever. And oh. they're seen all the time and nobody knows it. Uh, there was a picture I shot of Matt Riddle like three years ago. Um, it was a black and white picture of him on his knees. And he was in the ring. He just dropped Cedric Alexander on his head. And he just was sort of on his knees basking in the booze of the crowd, you know. And, With all uh, his big muscles pumping out, uh, jumping out of the photo. Yeah. That I know that photo. That is an excellent. He's right in the middle of the ring. It's an excellent photo. Yeah. And that was his social media picture on most of his platforms for a couple of years. Ah, I, that's why I know I it. Being, <laughs> I, being a dummy, didn't sell it to him watermarked. I sold it to him unwatermarked. So oh. every time anyone sees that picture, there's no River Horse logo on it. There's no nothing. It's just this picture of Matt Riddle. And he made a T-shirt out of it, and he did all that stuff. And God bless him. I mean, we did business, and business was over, and there's no sour grapes. But you look at it and you go, there's that picture again, and no one – so then you find yourself on social media going, hey, everybody, this is my favorite picture I ever took. And you put the watermark version of it up, and people go, you shot that? You know, kind of thing. It happened with Allison Kay, too. She has these um, cutouts that she gives fans. They're like her big pictures of her that are on sticks. And yep. they'll, sh they'll show them at uh, shows. And um, – I was watching, uh, what was the show? I think it was Backlash last year. Backlash uh, 2018. And I was watching a, a promo by Nia Jax. And um, my kid goes, there's a picture of yours. And I'm like, what? And he's like, back it up. So we, we rewound. And he goes, look over her left shoulder in the audience. Oh, yeah. That's Allison Kay. Yeah. And I'm like, okay. So I backed it up. And so we both got up and walked, because my kid is he's a flipping genius. But uh, I got up and walked over to the TV, because I have old eyes, and I'm staring at the TV, and I'm looking through, and I'm like, all right, there's a little kid, and oh, there's a popcorn box. And, Holy crap, that's Allison Kate right there. So, uh, you know, screenshotted the picture, and then blew it up 13 times. And I'm like, that's me. And then, so <laughs> my kid, who's really internet savvy, did a search and found the exact same picture from the other side, like they had shot, it's a double-sided picture. And so we had a picture from the other side, from the top of the audience looking at the ring, and it was a really super big picture of it. And there's, she has tons of fans and whatever. So those aren't watermarked, but you see them there. You see them at the Mae Young Classic, those uh, Allison Kays on a stick. You see her when she was Sienna and, and Impact, those Allison Kays on a stick. It's She's got one pinky pointing out and one pinky pointing straight up, and oh, yeah. nobody knows I. No one knows I shot it. So <laughs> that's got to be frustrating a little bit. But at the same time, it's it's cool that you know your work is getting out there, and and, and yeah. with social media, you can you can make that point. You know, even with this right. show, you're making that point. Hey, that's what that's right. some of my work as well. There. Let, let me ask you a well, question because I, I don't think a lot of folks. Um, first of all, you're an award-winning photographer. And again, you you you've worked with really a lot of the who's who in, in pro wrestling right now, especially this next generation coming up on the indie scene. Sure pays to be in Florida because you you have so much access to them. It does. But yeah, but let me ask you this: I am I I know a lot of wrestling photographers and and, and familiar with them through the years and what have you. I got to say, you're the first black wrestling photographer that I've ever spoken to. I, I didn't even know yep. uh, even existed in the, in, the, in the industry. Are you unique in that regard, or or is there a lot of black wrestling photographers out there we just haven't heard from them? I personally know two. Um, there's one in Atlanta, and then there's one out west. Uh, but, yeah, I'm really pretty unique. And people have a tendency to be kind of surprised when I show up. It's sort of... You know, hey, I'm River Horse. Oh, you're River Horse, you know. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm the River voice Horse. changes. <laughs> yeah, I'm like, oh, 
well, isn't that special, you know, kind of thing. And so, like, you know, River Horse goes for, I mean, Alan Roulette is kind of not a, it's kind of a nondescript name. Uh, my dad was very big on accents. Like, he hated accents. He, his, my dad was old school. He was, uh, he was from Missouri. You know, he was, boy, he was in, he was almost 50 when I was born. And, um, very old school guy. And his thing, we lived in, uh, I'm from Cleveland, and, uh, we spent a lot of time in the projects because we were broke. And if I came home at all, sounding like the folks that we lived with, that was it for me. He's like, no one's going to hire you. No one's going to you know, pay attention to you. You have to go out there. You have to be businesslike. You have to, you know, that kind of thing. So um, your typical Ohio accent is pretty nondescript anyway. Uh, you start to get into the inner cities in Cleveland. It's, it's that. But, I mean, if you go to Akron or Youngstown or something like that, <laughs> you're, you're looking at some pretty nondescript people. I, I know tons of black people that talk like I do from Ohio. You know, in Indiana and Wisconsin and you know, all that stuff. So it never was a big deal to me. You know, I mean, I had people who had more of an accent and people who had even less of an accent than I do. But when I do business on the phone or they see my name, they see my work, there's not a lot of pictures of me floating around out there doing uh, photography. Uh, again, the influence of my father. Boy, they can't see you coming, you know, that kind of thing. So um, the... um so, yeah, people do have a tendency to be really pretty surprised. Um, but uh, luckily, you know, um, with some exceptions, I mean, wrestling was a very open family, you know. Um, you know, maybe not in the 70s or early 80s or whatever, but now, I mean, you go on a show, you've got accents and languages and orientations and, you know, uh, ideas and everything just floating around out there that it's just it's a microcosm of america and i wouldn't even i'll go one step further and say it's probably what america should aspire to um you know you go on a show it's it there's you'll see everybody you'll hear everybody um i shoot for full throttle pro wrestling you know uh full throttle in in um st petersburg uh has a black owner jay ritchie uh, the people who are influential in that company are, most of them are black, you know, Saeed Al-Sabah and Barrington Hughes from MLW, he, he wrestles there, he's the champ now, and, um, you know, as an old black dude, I'm 51, you just, I come away from that show just feeling so warm and happy when I'm there. Like, I come back, oh, look these young brothers coming up, you know, <laughs> just, <laughs> these brothers taking care of business, you know, I just get, yeah, and I start channeling my dad, you know, or start channeling, you know, all the older people in my neighborhood. Look at this. Just look around, you know. <laughs> you know, so <laughs> and it's just so being being black in the business is is good. It's a good thing. Uh it sets me apart. You know, if there's four photographers at ringside, you can say, Well, that's Bobby over there and you know, like, uh well, where's River Horse? Yeah, he's a black guy right there. <laughs> you know, it's really super <laughs> easy. So it's like it sets me apart. It's my, it, it's being blacks almost become part of my gimmick. You know, it's just, it's my appearance. It's my costume. You know, I have my rubber horse shirt on. I bring my brown skin with me and, you know, away we go. And it's, it's more of a benefit than anything. So that's deep. That's deep. Listen, I, but before I let you go, uh, last week we had a, a great wrestler on who has really been kicking butt all over the place there. Uh, Jesse Jones. You actually uh, photographed her before as well, huh? I did a couple of years ago. She was in Shine, and uh, it was when I first started doing – it was towards the beginning of when I started doing promos there. And um, she was just – she was hilarious, and she was funny, and she was opinionated, and – you know, most of the time when you're backstage and you're shaking hands and you're talking to people and this and that, people have a tendency, you know, you have some people who are louder and some people who are quieter and some people who are, you know, warming up and some people who are, you know, chatting up girls and some people are whatever. And she was just a unique character, you know, backstage. Um, and she was always funny. And the, the when, uh, when I shot her, she was wearing, uh, 
she was wearing camouflage gear, and um, I had, was doing two different types of shoots. So I was I was shooting her on a white background for more promo-y type things, but I wanted to shoot her uh, on a black background too. So I had two backdrops set up, and I said, "Let's do some, I don't know, some sexy kind of meaningful. Give me a good, you know, kind of sexy pose. Like you've been giving me the finger and you've been waving your fists at me and everything. Like let's let's settle it down, do some girly stuff." And she's like, "I don't know how to do that." <laughs> she goes, that, she's like, honey, that's just not me. And, you know, <laughs> like, so I'm like, let's work through it a little bit. And because usually with my, with my straight photography business, you know, we can work through things like that. But when wrestlers are at work, they're in their character and they have their character in their head. And, you know, it just wasn't, it kind of wasn't meant to be, but we got some really good pictures of her. She was a lot of fun. Let me tell you something that, that you just described Jesse to a T and, I'm glad that you didn't push too hard there because she would have broken your arm. You know, that's, she's, yes. she's pretty well known for that. So. Yes, sir. <laughs> Listen, if, if fans, aspiring pro wrestlers, pro wrestlers and, and just athletes in general, if, if folks want to get in touch with you, if they want to shoot with you, if they want to see some of your work, throw it all out there. What's the best way they can reach you and, and, and your social media, all that good stuff? Well, I shoot everything. I'm a freelance photographer, so I've shot wrestlers' engagement pictures and um, uh, the uh, maternity and and all of that. I do all of that, you know, real estate, everything. Uh, So my regular photography business is River Horse Photography. You can find me on Facebook at at, at River Horse Photography. You can find me on Instagram at River Horse underscore photography. Um, And then I have riverhorsephotography.com. If you want to get in touch with me, you can get in touch with me at riverhorsephotography at Gmail. Everything's riverhorsephotography. Um, the wrestling thing kind of is an offshoot. Uh, it's a very pleasant, very happy sort of side business that I have. So everything else is riverhorse wrestling photography. So on Facebook, riverhorse wrestling photography. On Instagram, uh, it's riverhorse wrestling photography all mashed up together. Um, and then uh, if you want to get in touch with me again, it's riverhorsephotography at Gmail. It's the same. Yeah, I'm not going to have two emails. Um, and, and if you want to see my stuff on Twitter, it's almost always wrestling. So it's riv underscore, what's it, R-I-V underscore horse underscore photo. Um, but, you know, you can always call me or text me, uh, 863-409-7143. Um, I set shoots up all the time. I have openings all the time uh, because with the wrestling business, people schedule and then they get a booking and they're gone. And so don't think you can't get in because I, I get scheduled a lot, but I get cancellations a lot too. So it's kind of a revolving door. Um, the uh, But I do everything. And I do more than just wrestling. I, I do uh, real estate. I do couples. I do families. I do senior pictures I do all of that and then on top of that I shoot wrestling too so promoters I'll shoot your show uh ringside pro- promos whatever you like and individual fan eight individual wrestlers I do that uh if you're a fan and you see pictures you like I sell everything that I do so if you have a particular wrestler that you love get in touch with me and I can make you a gallery you can take a look at it and we'll see what we can sell you uh with WrestleMania weekend coming up if you get these photos, then you can hopefully see them that weekend in New York somewhere, or WrestleCon or, uh, I don't know, some show. And you can get them to autograph them and everything. They love doing that. So, And if you'll see them on wrestlers' tables that they're selling, too. So, Good stuff. Good stuff. His name is Alan Roulette. Listen, Alan, uh, with this River Horse photography, you really have found uh, what I would consider your life's purpose. Uh, telling people's stories and, and doing so through photography. But what's interesting is that your personal life story is, is really something else. It's inspirational. It's great. Uh, you know, you're a black man out there where there aren't very many of us doing what you're doing and you're doing it at, a, at an award winning level. And that is why I wanted to have you on the show. I wanted to celebrate what you're doing and, and just say to the world, this is somebody that we should pay attention to and support. So keep up the great work, Alan. Awesome. Thank you. Hey, everybody. This is Rudy Russo, and you're listening to Duke Loves Wrestling. How do you like them, Montana? Wow. 
Wow. I'll tell you right now, Alan Roulette, that, that, that guy is just amazing. And like I told you, folks, you got to head over to River Horse Photography. That's River Horse Photography. Check out what he has going on there because it's just, it's awesome. I mean, seriously, I tip my hat to that guy. He is a well-accomplished, award-winning photographer. He's found a way to get his foot in the door in pro wrestling, something that he grew up watching that he's always loved. And now he's in a position where the wrestlers are, are literally beating his door down because they want him to to shoot them. And the work is just tremendous. You know, Alan, he gave me the green light to post some of his work as we advertise this episode, which I'm going to do. A lot of pictures out there that you've seen of these wrestlers, especially like some of the really, really good ones. Uh, that's Alan's work, man. So for all of you knuckleheads out there that are posting Alan's photos, I hope you're allowing the watermark to stay where it needs to be so he can get some kind of attribution, some time of type of credit for that that guy works hard man and to be a a well-accomplished black man in the world of photography and especially in the world of of pro wrestling photography as as an addition to what he's already doing on on you know his main job which is to photograph everybody general public but the fact that he has a pro wrestling photography division within his company not a lot of black guys doing that. Not on the level that he's doing it. And he's doing it at, at a really high level. So, again, shout out to River Horse Photography, Alan Roulette. That's my man right there. Good good dude. Real good dude. Folks, I, you know, at the end of each show, you know how it goes. Whether the Boston Bad Boys here and, and we're having a, a discussion slash debate about a hot topic. Whether I'm riding solo like I am this week and, and I just share my thoughts on something, you know how it goes. I, I don't hold back, take off the gloves, I get down and dirty with it because I want our listeners out there to really consider some of these topics. I really want you to think about what's going on. Think about how this affects the grand scheme of, of everything that we care about, which is the pro wrestling as, a, as an entire industry. The wrestlers, the promotions, merchandise, TV and internet product, all of that, all of that is under the umbrella of the industry, right? So it, it really gets my dander up when I think about this Kofi Kingston angle in the WWE leading up to WrestleMania. And I saw something interesting over the past week where WWE Hall of Famer and really the voice of most of our childhood, Jim Ross. Jim Ross had some some comments about the Kofi Kingston angle, and he was pretty upfront and blunt on his Twitter and, and also on his um, podcast, which I listen to every week. I love Jim Ross's podcast. Good stuff. But JR feels that storylines about race and religion have no place in pro wrestling, at least today's modern product. Now, listen, I, I'm going to tell you right now, I don't necessarily disagree with JR. And I think the way that it's been done, especially, you know, the old tired way in terms of religion, you know, the, the, the scary Muslim against everybody else, that's just insulting. It's ridiculous. And with race, you know, black guy, you're not as good as we are. You know, the white guy and all this. It's just, or the or Asian guy, you can't speak English. Or Spanish guy. It just, yes, that stuff is very distasteful. There's no two ways about it. And let me preface this by saying, listen, I like conflict. Let, let's let's not pretend like we don't understand what's going on here with this show. We're, we're coming up on our three-year anniversary. If you talk to anybody who, who knows me beyond the show, who just knows who I am personally, they'll tell you, I'm not afraid of conflict. I enjoy having discussion with people who disagree with me and that I disagree with on any topic. doesn't matter what it is. Because I feel like it's like having a pickup game of basketball or, or playing a, a competitive video game with somebody. You're going to learn something when you are 
tested and challenged and forced to defend your position. And you may not always win. And you may not always lose. And sometimes winning and losing is not the point. I'm going to express how I feel about something. You express how you feel about something. We will defend our positions and maybe we walk away generally feeling the same way we felt when we walked in, but we probably learned something. There's too many of us out there who are afraid of conflict. They're afraid to have conversation about things that make us uncomfortable. And I think the things that make us uncomfortable are the things that we should be talking about the most. Because if you bury your head in the sand and if you don't confront these issues, you're never going to learn. And in the end, it, it may actually stifle you, may hurt you in some way. And I say all that because Jim Ross, somebody who I respect And who I appreciate for what he's done for pro wrestling. Somebody who I enjoy paying attention to, whether I'm I'm listening to him commentate or I'm listening to his podcast or I'm reading something that he's written. I, I legitimately enjoy Jim Ross. But Jim Ross said that this Kofi Kingston angle makes him uncomfortable. Because it, it it seems to him that there's elements where it's about race or it's been turned into something about race. And that makes him uncomfortable. And what I say to Jim Ross, a man who's, you know, in his 60s from Oklahoma. A man who worked for a guy who, who you know, cowboy Bill Watts, who in an interview basically identified himself as a racist. What I say to Jim Ross is, well, welcome to the party, big man. You're uncomfortable with something that deals with race. Imagine how comfortable you uncomfortable you would be if you were the person on the receiving end of these racial issues. Now, some of you are going to say, oh, come on, Duke. Why'd you have to go there, man? And what do you Hey, listen, this ain't the show for you. I was talking to a buddy of mine the other day and he was saying, man, you know, I don't really like uh, the fact that you guys talk so much about politics on your show. I don't, it, it really, you know, turns me off. Oh, this might not be the show for you because politics is very important. It affects every aspect of our lives. And the guy who allegedly is the president of the United States, he's a WWE Hall of Famer. Everything he does has an impact on the wrestling business, whether directly or indirectly. And you'd be a fool to think that that's not true. He is a representative of the business that we care about. If he's discriminating against, that affects the wrestling business somehow, some way. Somebody's going to try to replicate that in storyline form. And we'd be fools to think that the WWE hasn't introduced introduced some of that stuff in a sly way, but hasn't introduced some of that stuff in, in what they're doing. But I digress. Jim Ross is uncomfortable with the Kofi Kingston storyline. Okay. I can understand why a white guy from Oklahoma in in his 60s who's worked for open racists, I said it again, and that's probably going to offend a few people, and I don't care because Cowboy Bill Watts is quoted. He got fired from WCW for openly proclaiming his racism through what he said you can't spin it and a lot of you try to but that's just a bunch of crap can't spin that's what he is i'll say it again i can understand why a guy like jim ross would be uncomfortable with this because you're being forced to face the realities of that which you have benefited from some way somehow You know, Big E did a video where he discussed the fact that it's not a secret traditionally in in the pro wrestling business. Guys like us, and you know what Big E is talking about. Guys like us don't get these opportunities. We don't get to be champion. We don't get to be the main event on a consistent basis. We don't get to be positioned in a manner where we're the top merchandise sellers. 
And some knucklehead listening right now is, oh, come on, Duke, Biggie, uh, you know, New Day, they sell a lot of merchandise. Yeah, they do. That was that was in spite of the fact that they weren't positioned that way initially. They had, they had to earn that. They had to fight for that. Not only did they earn it, they had to force it. The fans forced that based on the fact that New Day were relentless in what they were doing. WWE had no choice if they wanted to make a buck. So don't give me that crap. Listen, the WWE could have an abundance of black champions at the at the snap of a finger. This is not a competitive sport. It's sports entertainment where some guy with a pencil determines who wins and who loses. Some guy with a pencil determines who's going to be the face and who isn't going to be. And damn it, don't ever think at any time, it's anything uh, less than that. So when Big E was talking about what he was talking about, sure, it was a worked shoot. Okay. But it was the truth. Jim Ross is uncomfortable with it. Good. <laughs> Good. I'm uncomfortable with the fact that I've watched pro wrestling for over 36 years. And the overwhelming majority of the people that I've seen lauded and celebrated and, and, and put on the highest peaks don't look like me. I'm insulted by that. The face of your company doesn't hardly ever looked like me. In a, in, a, in a nation where the majority of our top athletes look like me. And this is supposed to be athletic exhibitions. So you're, you're, the face of your company most of the time does not look like me. Yeah, I'm insulted by that. That makes me uncomfortable. So, so Jim Ross, welcome to the party, bro. And you've worked for companies, especially the WWE, that has taken advantage and used racial overtones, undertones, and have put it in your face. But it makes you uncomfortable. That's what you're expressing right now. You don't want to see it anymore. Okay, fine. But that doesn't mean it needs to go away. We need to talk about this. We need to take your face and shove it in the pie and, and whirl it around, my friend. Can you smell it? Can you taste it? Can you feel it? You need to be uncomfortable. Because what's happened to lead up to this point has been unacceptable. And the history of the business that has given you so much, Jim Ross, is unacceptable. And you were in positions where you had a hand and some of the decisions that were made. And don't try to play like you didn't, Mr. Head of Talent Relations and all these other things. You had a voice. And I'm not saying you didn't stick up for certain people and didn't move the needle in certain ways. I, I hope you did. I know that a lot of people still speak fondly of you and respect you and all that good stuff. You're uncomfortable. Good. And everybody else who's uncomfortable with this, good. I'm uncomfortable with it too. Good. But but we need to have this moment. It needs to be confronted. The racism. It needs to be confronted. The same way the sexism is being confronted. Damn. The women had to beat themselves bloody just to get in the damn main event. 15 years ago, Molly Holly had to get her head shaved just to be in the match. <laughs> embarrassing we need to confront that it makes you uncomfortable okay so what and it's okay to express that and it's okay for me to confront you on that and to say to you hey <laughs> good now you know how it feels and I'm going to tell you right now, if Kofi Kingston is not the champion, and if he doesn't hold that belt for a significant period of time, there'll be hell to pay for that. Of course there will be. It's like this thing with the women right now. You know, they, they took the belt off of Oscar on Tuesday. And now the, the SmackDown Women's Championship is going to be part of the WrestleMania main event. So it'll be the Raw and the SmackDown titles all in the main event. Ronda. 
Becky and Charlotte. I'm assuming that they're going to be battling for both. It might be a unification. Who knows? But they took the belt off Oscar. Literally one of the greatest wrestlers in the world right now. Who is just completely underutilized. It's, it's, it's criminal what they're doing to her. That makes me uncomfortable. You have this crossover superstar. She's Japanese. She She's an amazing talent. Gorgeous. She's colorful. The fans love her. And you took the belt off for her 10 days before WrestleMania? Are you kidding me? We need to talk about that. We need to talk about that. We need to talk about what the hell's going on with Naomi right now. Where is she? <laughs> we need to talk about that. Where's Ember Moon? Maybe she's injured. Who knows? But where is she? Why is it the same old, same old when it comes to, to wrestlers of color and especially black wrestlers? We need to talk about that. You're uncomfortable. Good. You should be. And I hope you continue to be. Because what's going on is unacceptable. And if we don't confront it, then what does that say about us? We'll just continue to, to repeat the same mistakes that have been going on since the beginning. So for everybody out there that's uncomfortable with what's going on with some of these storylines that involve racism, sexism, religion, good. Now my question to you is, what are we going to do about it? And how are we going to put the pressure on these wrestling companies, especially the WWE, to deliver something better? Not only from a quality wrestling product standpoint, but from an intellectual standpoint, from a storytelling standpoint, how are we going to apply the pressure on them to deliver something better? I don't give a damn that you're uncomfortable. What are we doing about it? And furthermore, why are you uncomfortable? Is it because you don't want to confront the realities of what's going on? Not only in the world, but in the in the very business that you have benefited so much from. Come on. Let's talk. And you the listeners, let's talk. You don't have to agree with me on this. You could tell me that I'm way off base and disrespectful or something. I'm okay with that. Go ahead. Tell me how you feel. Facebook, Twitter, YouTube. You can email me. Duke loves wrestling. Let me know. I'm okay with that. Sometimes you got to get uncomfortable in order to, to solve problems. I'm all for it. That's all I got for this week, folks. Heavy stuff. Next week, we'll be reviewing WrestleMania. Or previewing, I should say. We'll go over the whole weekend there with uh, NXT and the main card, as we do. You know, it's going to be the longest WrestleMania in history. That's what's being anticipated. So that'll be interesting. Be kind to yourselves. Be kind to others, please. Please. 